Well, um, welcome everybody um, who's, who's decided to join this webinar today. First of all, thank you for taking the time to, to join us today with the University of Manchester. We really appreciate it. We understand that these are testing times um, and for many people, uh, much, especially in education, uh, much tougher times now than they are generally uh, due to um, different ways of uh, experiencing your workload let's say it like that um, for some people it means more work than before um, for others less um, whatever the case let's sort of step away from that now for um, some some few minutes under an hour and and think more progressively and think more emancipatory about our futures and about um, about becoming better and making the world a better place and making our schools a better place and starting with our work environment which is essentially what um, any any rigorous master's degree in educational leadership uh, should and would be about is about making places um, where education happens uh, better places to learn and to teach and to interact making them more collegial making them more professional and then your part in that as a leader in um, influencing processes and people in order to make that happen. So in brief, um, this master's degree is called the MA, Educational Leadership in Practice. And this talk today is um, going to look in a little more detail as to uh, what, what leadership is about, and what education is about and, and how we approach that. So we've titled it uh, today, A Microscopic View of Educational Leadership. Um, and the tagline for the degree is to be the positive change in your education organization. Um, and I'm, I hope I can now go from page to page like this. I'm gonna try, I might need some help. Uh, let's see, bear with me. Hmm, not sure I can, change the page there i'm by the way i'm not in dubai i'm i'm in austria at the moment in my home uh, in my front room so welcome to my front room everybody um, this is where i am we're all on lockdown with covid19 um and uh i managed to get to austria which is where my home is and it's to escape the island of britain in in the um, literally one of the last ships out of britain about six weeks ago um, and here I am, um, but it doesn't make any difference these days because we're all online anyway. Um, I was just wondering, could we change this um, PowerPoint? Could we go, move to the next slide, please, if possible? Excellent. Now, there's a little video here which tells you a little bit about uh, the University of Manchester. I'm great. I'm not sure if it will work, but before we try and start it, let me just introduce it to you a little bit. Um, don't know how much you know about the University of Manchester, but if you think about British universities, everybody knows Oxford and Cambridge, right? So they started out in the 11th and 12th centuries or 12th and 13th centuries, so nearly a thousand years ago. And these were typically the, you know, the, the bastions of the elite classes and those who had money and influence and privilege could go there and study. And for, for many centuries in England, that was all you had. The Scots are different. They, they actually had more universities quicker than the English did. And it wasn't until the 1800s that, you know, in the, in the midst of the Industrial Revolution, when, when Britain was, you know, a world power, but also where there were huge issues of inequity and, and, and poverty and uh, within the mass production of the Industrial Revolution, Manchester was at the core of this movement. And out of this came um, a people's need and desire for people to also become educated. And that's where basically, if you like, the DNA of Manchester comes from. So Manchester has a very, very strong connection with people and with, uh, with, with justice and with equity. And I think uh, Professor Woods here, who's one of our history professors, he's speaking for the faculty and um, our educational leadership degree belongs to the School of uh, Environment, Education and Development, which belongs to the faculty um, of humanities and he talks to you about our humanity and I think I've pinpointed this video because I think it's a very important point to make 
but in everything that we do as we as we work in the social sciences too we are working on our humanity because we as educators we work with humanity every single day not only do we work with it we develop it and we grow it um and so i think this video should speak to all of us in a way so let's give it a shot see if it works Yeah, I wasn't sure if it was going to work or not. Um, but for I those of you, it's going to work, Alex. Uh, sorry for that. <laughs> so if you if you want to watch it, you can probably watch it after this talk now. Just uh, put into your search engine Michael Wood and Professor of History, and then Talk of Manchester. And uh, I think it really speaks. It spoke to me. I'm sure it would speak to you too about being a part of Manchester and being a part of something bigger and uh, something strong. Um, before we move on to the next slide, just a couple of facts about Manchester, if you didn't know. Um, um, if, if you work in the academic world, in, then, then for you, things like uh, rankings and, and, and all these uh, things that are very important these days, they're less important to us. We sort of, uh, we assume and we anticipate and expect that all good institutions are generally just very very good and they do very good work but if those things do interest you then manchester has done particularly well in the last uh, years it i think it's now ranked at number the 25th university in the world um and i think it's number six in the united kingdom so it's it's achieved very good things over the last few years and part of that is because manchester does have this very long like i said this very long DNA, this very, um, very astute academic and very rigorous profile of being one of the top, literally, research universities in the world. So being a part of Manchester is being a part of something much bigger. But the other side of that is, of course, the, the demands on, on the student and uh, on faculty as well are, of course, high because the quality that we produce in Manchester is very, very high. And it's not for nothing that we've we've attained that and we achieve that and we maintain that. So being a part of Manchester and having a master's degree from Manchester is, I mean, I think that that's a, a very a very high bar indeed. Um, and I welcome everybody who who's up to the challenge of doing that. So let's move on to the next slide, if we can. Good. So uh, that little ruffian there, that's me. Uh, in 1979 in London and uh, I, I fished out that picture a while ago and I looked at it and I saw myself in my school uniform that was me at Willington School in in Wimbledon 1979 um, and I've got a look of surprise on my face um, probably because I was in a photo booth um, flash photography probably wasn't used to that um, but I it made me think about what my worries were when I was uh, eight years old what was I worried about as a kid? And, and I mean, you know, we had worries back in the 70s and 80s. Children had worries about things like nuclear war. That was a kind of common thing that children would often have nightmares about even. But I can't remember being worried about that then. I was still too young. Um, but um, nowadays, what children are worried about are very, very different things because we've now moved into a different epoch, if you like, in, in world history. People will look back at this time and, and recognize a clear distinction between, say, the 70s and 80s and 90s and now in the 21st century. And what is it that defines that? And what is it that now concerns our young children and our young people and our young adults that we educate? And again, the question is how much of educational leadership, management and administration really um, reacts to that? How much of that science is still rooted in the old white men of the 1970s and 1980s who, who wrote all the rules and all the policies and uh, did all the research and still steer so much of the research today? Well, in my view, and the, also the view of, of our, our faculty at Manchester, still far too much of it is, is concerned with these older issues of the day. And our world has moved on. Next slide, please. 
So, next slide. Good. So, um, I will come back to that in a second. Let that, that just now uh, sit in your mind for a while, that thought, you know, what has changed and what concerns young people, what concerns us. So, this is me, right? I'm, I'm the course director of, of this master's degree in educational leadership. Um, all of our degrees at Manchester have a, have a we call them program director. You'll find that in every university, there's always a program director or course director, depending on how they call it. So I've been in international education for actually longer now, for 23 years, no, actually since 1995, so 25 years now. Um, and part of that has been uh, my passion in exploring educational leadership. Um, I've got a fair bit of research and teaching experience over those 25 years. Um, I used to be a senior lecturer at the Royal Military Academy Sandhurst, which is in the southeast of England. Um, and I was, uh, that was a very interesting experience working there because I worked more in the psychology department, and the psychology of leadership and communication. Um, and from there, I joined then the University of Manchester. Uh, prior to that, I had been a, a head of department and coordinator in international schools um, for quite a while. And before that, I was actually in, in your region, in the Middle East. I was in Abu Dhabi for about four years, uh, where I was faculty uh, there at, a, at the higher colleges. Um, and before that, I was in Central Europe. And so I've, I've been um, around the world a bit with my teaching. And uh, through the course, you'll be connected to the academics of the Manchester Institute of Education. So we're not a department of education. We're not a school of education. We are an institute of education, much like at UCL, you have the Institute of Education there too. So uh, those of you who know the field a little bit will be very familiar with the work of Helen Gunter. Uh, Helen Gunter is our senior professor in, in our area, and of course, uh, Dr. Stephen, Gun uh, Stephen Courtney, sorry, who is also one of our intellectual influences um, in, our, in our hub there, and an, a number of other, a range of other academics who you might know as well, uh, who we work with on a daily basis. Uh, this is one of the, the privileges of working somewhere like Manchester is that you get to work with um, very familiar names uh, on a daily basis and people who are well known and have done groundbreaking research and, and really define uh, the field as it is. Next slide, please. Next slide. Good. Okay, so Manchester, right? So what do we know about Manchester? Well, you know, Manchester, um, in a way, the history of Manchester is the history of the world. Uh, you know, two, three hundred years ago, it was the, this, this bustling centre of the British Empire where everything was being produced in huge factories and, you know, um, huge amount of industry going on. In fact, the symbol of Manchester is the bee because the, Man the Mancunians regard themselves as the busy bees. And so that's the symbol of Manchester is the bee. On the bottom left, you can see a picture of the university and the other pictures you can see snapshots of, of Manchester. Uh, people very often associate Manchester with the football clubs, of course. You've got Manchester United and you've got Manchester City. Um, and uh, you know, Manchester now is a, is a post-industrial city. Uh, the university is one of, one of the big aspects of the city, uh, but there are many others as well. Um, we have a tram system in Manchester, if you ever come and visit, uh, but you'll see a lot of Manchester is kind of this reclaimed um, uh, industrial land that's been turned, you can see in the bottom picture there, where it's been turned from canals, which used to, you know, go between Liverpool and Manchester, pulling products backwards and forwards. It's now turned into a, very much a, a business centre and, uh, and a very kind of up and coming, uh, prosperous uh, area. Some people would argue, but in my opinion, Manchester is Britain's second city after London, um, and it's definitely the powerhouse and capital of the North, I would say. Next slide, please. Right, so let's go back again to that thought I deposited with you. Uh, what are children concerned about now? What are young people concerned about now? What are we concerned about now? Well, the big deal at the moment, COVID-19 aside, is the climate emergency, right? Um, I have myself four children and I know from experience that 
uh, my children are passionate about this issue. Uh, they see this as their future. This is where we, the older generation, they believe, let them down. We lived a very comfortable, nice lifestyle, uh, consuming resources and not caring about the world around them, around us, and now we're leaving them with this legacy. And we can see this in all the evidence around us, changing weather patterns, uh, forest fires, uh, look at what was happening in Australia just a few months ago. Um, these are devastating issues that confront our young people on a daily basis. Now the question is what does educational leadership management and administration do to prepare children and young people to move out into this world and become responsible citizens? Next slide please. Next slide. Please. Um, another issue that is becoming quite apparent now as we move further into the 21st century, uh, we have a term called the, the kleptocratic class. Who would have thought of that when I was a little boy in 1979, there would actually be a class of that. Kleptocratic means stealing. You know, there is a class of people who steal. Um, let's look at the, the banking crisis in 2008, uh, where literally, um, very rich people got stupendously rich by stealing money off people, including millions of pensioners and their pension funds, devastating whole economies. Uh, the, we're still living with the burden of that, and they got away scot-free. Um, society shielded them from any kind of worries. If, if you and I had done that, we'd have gone to prison for a long time, but these people didn't. And, and this is an issue that young people are aware of. Uh, they access this kind of data, they're familiar with it. And yet, what does leadership in school do to make people more critical about these things and engage them more in wider conversations if we really are concerned with uh, the world around us and, and connecting with the world around us? And this is an important point, connecting with the communities around us, with the children around us, with the families around us, with the homes that they come from, from the international places that they come from and not just working out how this lesson plan is going to work and how I get that teacher to do what I want them to do, because there is a bigger picture in all of these things that is a responsibility of an educational leader. Next slide. The migration crisis, uh, obviously, is enormous, particularly in Europe, uh, particularly for people from the Middle East and from Africa. This is an issue that the UN has been warning us about since the 1990s and nobody has done anything about it. And now it's starting to happen and it has been for the last six or seven years. The migration crisis is immense and massive. And these are big issues that concern us and yet they're issues that are very often swept under the carpet and not talked about. And these are issues that concern young people because this is their world and the world they're moving into. Next slide. Then of course we have, I put here right-wing extremism, but you could generally just say extremism because it could be left-wing as well. Um, but at the moment we tend to be seeing much more right-wing extremism around the world. Um, there, are, there are things happening in politics that when I was a little boy, thinking back to that picture, would have been unthinkable. They literally would have been unthinkable. Nobody would have imagined that um, a game show host from uh, and, and failed businessman uh, would become the president of the United States, for example. Nobody would have thought that uh, someone like Bolsonaro in, in Brazil would be uh, saying, yes, chop down all the rainforests, don't worry about it, that's fine. These are issues that really, really concern young people. And if they don't concern them, they should concern them. And again, the question is, what are we doing as educational leaders to make these discourses and these practices become normal within our schools, to develop critical thinking, critical appreciation, to be able to sift all the data out there and understand what's important and what's, what's valuable and what isn't. Next slide. Yeah, so here's a, quite an interesting map of the world here telling us about the inequality emergency. Right? I would term it an emergency. It's an ongoing emergency, but it, it keeps the same people rich and it keeps the same people poor. It's a system of domination that is spread 
around the world and continues on from and you know if you study post-colonialism this is what that's all about it shows us that um, essentially 1.8 percent of the world own 86 percent of the overall wealth right so we may see some some changes happening slight changes china is now becoming a big force so so wealth is starting to spread a bit uh, the middle east as well through um through particular policies and particular oil wealth etc has seen a, um, an increase there too but but these are little drops in the ocean really if you look at the big picture of the world and you see how inequality is just as rampant now um, as it was 300 years ago and uh, according to data and statistics it's not as bad as it was back then it's much 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 worse than it was back then and this is these are things again that you know if they're not affecting young people and children they should be affecting them because we're talking about the future citizens of our planet the ones who will go out into the world and either make it a better place or not and continue on with these things so as that responsibility as an educational leader this is all part of that sort of background thinking as to what it is to be a leader in education not a leader in business a leader in education next slide please Yes, and now we come to the talk of the town, right? So COVID-19. So as you're very much aware, um, COVID-19 has exposed many homespun truths to us around the world. It's shown us who's really important in society, right? So it's not bankers, it's not CEOs of companies, it's not even really the heads of the big directors of schools who are important. It's the teachers who are important. It's the support staff who are important. It's the people in the supermarket who are important. It's the nurses and the doctors who are important. And COVID-19 has really shone a, um, a microscopic lens on our societies and told us what is important for us as humanity to move forward and make sure that we continue on and prosper and survive. And it's also shown us that by working together and collaborating and looking past our differences, this is the way that we as a species manage to move on and survive. So there are many, many, many lessons in COVID-19 that for educational leaders can act as a catalyst, a spark point to start changing the way that we think about our world and moving things on. But this requires a will. And this requires a sense of intellectualism in order to not just do the same old thing from nine to five at work and then get in the same old car and drive the same old distance back home and do the same old things every day. So it's my contention that being a leader in education is much more than doing a nine to five office job. It's much more than that. It's one of the noblest professions that there is to be a teacher and even potentially more noble uh, to, to be in a leadership position, and it's a position where you serve and look after and nurture and collaboratively engage with your communities and your people. And this requires a big skill set, and it requires a big person. And that kind of big person doesn't happen just like that. That kind of person requires development and i'm not talking here about a weekend seminar on how you do leadership i'm talking about intellectual progress um, building capacity of the mind and this is what we aim to offer through this master's degree at manchester next slide please so i'm going to step aside now a little bit and talk about leadership so when i talk about leadership um, i'm I'm talking from different perspectives, but I'm aiming towards education. So I talk about my um, knowledge and experience from say, Sandhurst, right? From, from the military field, from the martial field. But I also talk about my many years of experience working in schools or international schools or in higher education or even in primary school or secondary school, which I've worked in every single one of them. Now, when we talk about leadership, what do we mean? Well, you know, leadership is this kind of big, 
nowadays it's a big sexy term, right? Everybody's trying to write a book about leadership and publish it and you can go to the airport and you'll see five or six books at the airport that you can pick up and, and read about leadership, you know, and everybody's trying to make a buck off leadership. Now this leads to the first problem in leadership is how is knowledge generated? Or most knowledge that you see in those kind of scenarios is ge generated by somebody whose primary underlying intention is to make some money, right? Now this is the worst way to approach leadership because leadership is and shouldn't be necessarily about making money, it should be about influence and it should be making a difference and making, especially in education, making things better, making people uh, or helping people to work together. So if we're talking about leadership as influence, the question is how do we influence people, right? And that picture there you can see is the traditional uh, view of leadership. And you'll find in underdeveloped scenarios or in developing countries this is everyone's standard idea of leadership leadership is very often it's a male thing and it's a thing about power it's about domination it's about telling people what to do and always having the answer whether you're right or wrong right so <laughs> this is this is quite a cute and charming view of leadership because in the real world that's not how leadership happens at all especially not in something like a social organization of the school. However, we are left with the peripheral understandings of leadership that are always influenced in this way. And you'll often see it when a new leader comes in and they try and be a little bit more collaborative with people. They'll get criticized left, right and center by people saying, oh, well, they're not very firm or they're not very strong. And especially in international contexts where a lot of you work, this is a real problem because you have many people from many different parts of the world all with different conceptions of what leadership means, and many of them will think that that's leadership. Um, so it's very difficult to get some kind of consensus there. However, why is this picture of leadership so applicable? Well, it's because leadership studies and the knowledge of leadership emerged from power, and it emerged from the battlefield. And it did that thousands and thousands of years ago because otherwise people wouldn't have talked about leadership and these people then ended up becoming dukes or sheikhs or kings or uh, emperors and so the concept of leadership was always very closely connected to power and elitism of course um so let's now spool forward to the 21st century and even the 20th century um we have this thing called social science now where we research people's behavior and we see what works and what doesn't work and, and social science has shown us that the that leadership influence um when it happens in this way is quite short term quite brutal and doesn't really work particularly well in a developed society right because people have got options they don't have to stick around in, in, a, in a very primitive society where people have got no options, that works. Um, I wouldn't say it works because people want it to, it works because people have no other choice, right? Um, however, a school environment is quite a sophisticated one in terms of human behavior. Um, it's quite an advanced one. And think about it, all teachers, um, and we all know a couple of teachers who will think, oh, they're not very bright, but generally, let's be fair, teachers are clever people. Right? Otherwise, they wouldn't be in the job doing that. And clever people will not stick around and put up with that kind of stuff for a long time. So we found that people who have a certain level of education, uh, who have certain goals in life, do not respond particularly well to this form of leadership. Um, and so what does work particularly well is um, a form of leadership that uh, is collaborative collegial and invites other people in, um, which is very, very far away from that form of leadership you see there. Um, however, power remains central to leadership and the leadership position is ultimately concerned with power. And so influence is concerned with power too. The question is, how do you influence? So next slide, please. I've got a cup of coffee here. I hope you don't mind. I'm going to Hmm. I'm sipping my coffee. Right. So 
um, for some of you, you'll know this. Some of you might not know it. I'm just going to go through different forms of leadership a little bit. So, so there, are, there isn't just one form of leadership. There are there are many different forms of leadership that can be identified. And um, so we might talk, for example, about one form of leadership called transactional leadership. And then we might look on the other end of the spectrum and talk about something called transformational leadership. Well, transactional leadership is like the name says, it's transactional. It's like, um, like if you think of business, right? So a businessman says, okay, I want to buy this product. So the transaction is handing over the money and the product gets given. The peripherals to this exchange, to this transaction, for example, whether the people get on with each other, uh, whether they respect each other, uh, whether they think the other person is good at their job, all of these things are essentially irrelevant because all that matters is the transaction. So this would be transactional leadership. And this is a form of leadership that we find quite to happen quite often also in education, where ed some educational leaders uh, don't necessarily bother to build or grow relationships because they see their job very much as going through a set of transactions to achieve goals. Other side of that, transformational leadership, is a form of leadership where the leader um, engages with the staff in order to inspire them um, about, say, the vision of the school or the mission of the school. Uh, they, they intellectually uh, develop them, so they, they treat them as intellectual equals and they like to grow their capacities, um, they inspire the people around them, uh, and they work collegially as well to get all of this kind of stuff done. Um, so that would be more like the kind of leadership that school teachers like. And then there's another form as well, which you're probably familiar with, called distributed leadership, which like the name says, is to distribute uh, the, the power and the responsibility of, of the main leadership position amongst the teachers and the staff. Um, I could go on for hours about distributed leadership, but I'll try not to go on about it too much right now. Um, and then in the international sector, of course, there are cultural aspects um, that crop up all the time. For example, things like, um, and if I can tell a quick anecdote, I knew this principal once who, in an international school, he was from Scotland, and, and he thought he was jolly funny, and he would tell jokes all the time, and, and all the British staff, especially from Northern England and from from Scotland, they would always understand what he was saying and laugh and thought it was great fun and they were all jolly jolly and colleagues and yet anybody who wasn't really from that area very often didn't get what he was saying because A, he spoke with an accent, and B, he spoke quite quickly and very often when everyone was laughing they would stand around uncomfortably looking at each other saying why is everybody laughing? We're at work and what this principal didn't realize was that um, by trying to create a nice um, amicable atmosphere, he was actually alienating people on a regular basis. Uh, people who would then walk away from these meetings feeling insecure about their position, feeling like maybe they were being laughed at. You never know, right? So there are all these cultural aspects that come into leadership as well in education, particularly in international contexts, um, that are very important for leaders to understand because Leadership is much more than the transaction. It's much more than just inspiring someone. It's actually about empathy as well. It's about generating trust. And it's about being a good um, understander of people, um, having those skills. And not everybody has that, but these are things that you can develop. But in order to do so, um, it's wise to undertake a rigorous course of intellectual development, such as this master's degree. Right, next slide, please. Okay. Right. Um, so, transformational and distributed leadership are the two that I touched on just now. These are two forms of leadership that are, are very fashionable at the moment. So, um, especially in international schools, uh, which is my specialist field, is international schools leadership. These are the forms of leadership that, that teachers, uh, when asked, will say, yeah, this is the kind of leadership I want. Um, they want their leaders to be collegial. They want them to trust them. They want them to be people they can approach. Uh, and this makes perfect sense. Let's uh, think about it, right? So 
Uh, if we go back to the old Taylorist, or say, so let's talk about Fordism, right? So when Henry Ford made his factory at the beginning of the last century, um, with conveyor belt systems, and, and so this whole idea of business became a bit of a science for the first time, and, and leadership became a bit of a thing, and management. Um, you had this very simple construct whereby the, the, the manager or the boss had an MBA from Harvard or from London or wherever. And all the workers had no qualification whatsoever because they just stood on an assembly line and did this all day. Uh, so you had this huge hierarchical divide between the manager and the worker, right? Um, now that developed a way of leading and a way of managing in business that has influenced all knowledge generation since on leadership. So many leadership ideas in education are influenced by that. But let's look at education. Education is a space where we have everybody in the school who's teaching has probably gone to university and has a degree, right? So they're all quite highly qualified. Uh, the person who's the leader of them possibly is not no better qualified than anyone else. They just have a particular ambition or a particular gift in a different direction that's not necessarily so much the classroom, but the administration, right? We would be very foolish now to apply a Fordist or Taylorist uh, scientific understanding of leadership to the school, because then the resource of the teachers, which is their intellect, their experience, their ability, is wasted. It would literally be throwing this out the window. It would be the most inefficient thing that we could possibly imagine. However, this is what's happening in education. This happens every single day in some school around the world or in hundreds, if not thousands of them. The problem here is, is that we, we have to stop thinking about education as being a hierarchy, where at the top you have the big, big boss, then you have the middle boss, then you have the lower boss, then you have this boss, and then you have a bunch of teachers. We have to stop thinking of education like that, because if we do think of it like that, we will philosophically and then behaviorally end up producing products much in the way that a factory does. We are not producing biscuits in schools where every single biscuit looks the same. We are helping and nurturing people to grow and take over this planet and world and define it for the future generations. That's why I come back to the fact that this is such a noble profession. And yet we have to make sure that the ways we approach leadership respect our colleagues and their professionality and the work that they do. Again, this is very interested in COVID-19 to see just how important those people are and how much respect they should have. And yes, we may find situations where teachers are, you know, act out or act strangely or don't do a particular job, but then just look into psychology briefly and you will find that people who are consistently undervalued, underpaid, um, not respected, not involved, not included, these people become hugely demotivated and it's perfectly understandable but then they possibly don't produce the same levels of commitment that, that they might otherwise do. And so transformational and distributed leadership are quite possibly good ways to, to even out this very stark hierarchy and start distributing power and responsibility around the school and, and including people and motivating them and bringing them in. Um, I think we've got a good picture there, which uh, if you click the next button, you'll see it, and the, the caption is, strong people don't put others down, they lift them up. Well, we've got to be a bit careful about this because all leaders and all principals in schools, they love saying things like this because it sounds really good, right? Um, you know, and, and then they go off and do, and very often what they do and what they say are two completely different realities. And, and in research, in educational leadership, we would call this a descriptive reality and a normative statement. So normatively, educational leaders like to orient towards transformational and distributed leadership. Descriptively, so i.e. when we observe them or when we see what they do, the behavior is often very different. So 
part of the study here is to, or part of the practice as a, as a leader, is to try and get your normative ideals to reflect your descriptive behavior. And we understand that that is an ongoing challenge. Uh, very few ed leaders can actually manage to do that. And the better ones can, and they do that, but they do that through a process usually of, of, of great reflection, a huge empathy with other people, a massive professional respect. Uh, can you click the next button there, uh, Dubai? Because then, oh, there you go. So, so this is the, the double-sided edge of leadership, right? Is that on the one hand, the leader will be the grand kind of person who says, strong people don't put others down, they lift them up. That's the normative statement. The descriptive reality is this, the strong person lifting up the weak person. And of course, if you know that's Darth Vader from Star Wars, he's strangling this person, right? Uh, so I think there's a beautiful irony in there as to how very often leadership um, leadership can cloak itself in, in a completely different discourse. Um, and we see that a lot. Okay, next picture, please. All right, and, and then of course in leadership, um, you know, what's very central to leadership in education more than anything else are values um, that might not be so important in say the area of business or somewhere else, but, but in education values are very, very, very important because values are, um, are how we learn to be members of society, how we learn to be responsible for the world around us and the people around us and very often we learn these at school and, and if you're lucky enough as a child to have um, an educated or down-to-earth or balanced family at home who take time for you to develop you then you're very lucky but we have to face the reality that that many of our children and young people don't have that and so for them school is very often the place where they learn values and and we as educational leaders, we, we have to stop playing this game of saying one set of values um, in the meeting and saying one set of values in the assembly and saying one set of values to the children and then behind closed doors or in the hallway or wherever, not living by them. Because children see what we do. And as Bandura, the psychologist says, um, children and young people, they will follow your modelled behaviour. They will not follow what you tell them. So values are very important as educational leaders to model. If I'm talking about having integrity and respect as an educational leader, then that has to flow through everything I do, every single day, in every interaction I have, because there's a whole audience of people just waiting to see you step out of doing that and then condemn you and there's a whole bank of children who are waiting and if they see you not doing what you say that is what they will do not what you say so it's incredibly important in education more so than in other places for educational leaders to have deep deep levels of integrity respect and, and all these other values that are up here so I think that's a very important point to make about ed leadership and why it's different possibly from other forms of leadership. Because in a company, you know, um, if, if your leader doesn't lead with integrity or with respect, then, you know, uh, after work, you might go and have a, have a little uh, moan with a colleague about that and, and that's done and dealt with, but it's not gonna change you for your life. With children, it will, because they are learning from us how to be people. And if we model to them these forms of behavior that are basically a lie, then that's what they'll think the world is all about. And that's, many would argue, that's the problem we're in right now, is that possibly um, uh, this is what's been going on for, for, for quite a long time now, since possibly the 80s. Even. So yeah, okay, let's move on to the next slide, please. Coffee's going cold here. Um, Hmm. Right. So an, an interesting concept to think about in, in leadership um, and in schools and in educational institutions is the concept of scarcity. Right. So when we talk about scarcity, I'm talking over here about um, 
very often these are these are initiatives that are pushed by policy. So in Britain, for example, we'd experience that from from the Department of Education. Uh, they would get policy handed to them by the cabinet, by Downing Street, saying, "Okay, you need to cut so and so many billion from your budget." That gets passed on to the Department of Education, who pass it down to the schools, who then say, "Okay, now we have to do the same with less." So we have fewer resources. Uh, we don't have as much as we had before. And this form of scarcity is very much a business model, right? So this is about efficiency and effectiveness. Efficiency and effectiveness are business concepts, right? Um, they're not necessarily educational concepts. Um, I think the idea of efficiency and effectiveness when trying to nurture uh, a four-year-old to learn something is a perverse idea. It should be about generosity and it should be about nurture, right? So efficiency and effectiveness are effectively the opposite almost of what education is about. And, at, and they, they, they produce scarcity, scarcity where we don't have enough books for the children. Perhaps we don't have enough pens and papers for them. We perhaps um, we have to say, okay, we, we have to cut now all the arts lessons in the school because you know, we don't have time for that anymore. And scarcity does strange things to people. So a good example here is, uh, that's a picture there of, of the, the Franklin expedition uh, in, in the 1850s, um, which was a British expedition to go around the North West Passage, so up Canada, and go across Canada through the ice and come out into the Pacific. And the idea was that by doing that, um, sailors wouldn't have to sail south around uh, Cape Horn anymore between Antarctica and South America because hundreds and hundreds of sailors died every every few years because of the terrible gales and storms down there. So, so there's a real real ambition to, to find the Northwest Passage and make the world a better place, right? So it came from a place of positivity. So these two ships were uh, specially equipped, their hulls were hardened with, with good British oak, and Franklin, who was a high-ranking uh, naval officer, left with 180 men, um, to great fanfare and applause uh, to go and find the Northwest Passage and was never seen or heard of again in the history of humanity. They disappeared and they never came back again. Um, recently, in the last 10 years, uh, interest developed about this expedition and so um, a Canadian team went out to find the remains of this lost expedition and after quite a while, they basically uncovered the story. They, they found one of the ships lying on on the sea floor under the ice. Um, they didn't find the second one, but they also found the last remains of the people. So essentially what had happened was, was that these ships had enough food for I think five years, um, but they got stuck in the ice and they kept eating the food, which was in tins. However, the tins were sealed with lead because back at that time, they didn't know that lead was poisonous. So the more the sailors ate the food from the tins sealed in lead, the more they started to get ill and get poisoning and blood poisoning and then they started to die and then Franklin the leader died and by this time they realized they were all going to die and they somehow realized they couldn't eat the food anymore but they had no way of, of finding food so they started to starve and then a, an expedition left the ships and tried to walk south and they were talking thousands of miles here through the tundra and eventually they they resorted to cannibalism and they started eating each other once they died. Now this is a devastating and shocking story, but what it shows us is what scarcity does to human beings when pushed to the extreme. It starts on the personal level. Once you introduce scarcity, you make people aware that they need to defend themselves and it makes people adversarial unless you have good leadership, of course. Right? Um, and that then goes on into a, a process of antagonism and being against each other, people pitting themselves against each other. And it's largely destructive, right? Education should be about the opposite. It should be about collaboration. It should be about cooperation. It should not be about fighting for a few resources. So, the good educational leader. Let's move on to the next slide, please. Can and should, in my view, foster an internal generosity 
towards the people around them. And I like to call this irresistible leadership because generosity is something that is irresistible to us humans. Uh, generosity is something that we all react to in positive ways. And generosity is not a difficult thing to do. Um, whether you are a religious person or whether you are a religious or whether you have a deep set of family morals or whether you don't, doesn't matter. We all know the simple equation, which is that generosity begets generosity. And so generosity can happen in many ways. It doesn't have to just be through financial things. Generosity can be time. Generosity be, can be uh, engaging someone in a conversation. Generosity can be uh, listening to people. It can be reacting to people. It can be giving them um, uh, opportunities to, to prove how good they are at doing something. It can be all sorts of different things. And yet climates of scarcity scare generosity away. And it's very difficult to be generous in a climate that's characterized by scarcity. And this is where that intellectual development comes in very, very handy that you get in a master's degree like this. That sense of understanding the bigger picture of being able to step out of those little micro politicking moments and see the bigger picture and revert back to the generous self, even to the extent where we have, we all have our little um, conflicts at work. We have our adversaries at work. To be able to step away from that and be generous towards even those people as well, right? So, so these are, are just generally good attributes of a collaborative and cooperative form of leadership. Um, because even if you were to look at it purely selfishly in terms of or getting the tasks done, that organization will function in a better way if we are able to achieve these collective goals. If people are happier, if people are, get up out of bed in the morning and they think to themselves, great, another day at work, I can't wait to get in, then you've done your job and you've done it very well because you've motivated people to, to engage with what are the important things. And, and part of that is having a generous approach towards other people. Okay, next slide. Hmm. So this isn't just me thinking all this up, this is based upon actual uh, psychological theory and behavioral theory. So there's this gentleman called McClellan, who as early as 1961 already um, developed um, motivational needs and a theory of motivational needs. Now, most educators will be familiar with motivation in terms of intrinsic and extrinsic motivation. Uh, you know, intrinsic motivation being, being things that, um, I'm, that motivate me because uh, I want them for myself for, for a particular reason for me. Extrinsic motivation being oh, I'm motivated by some external thing like, uh, you know, my mum and dad tell me I've got to do this, so oh, I've got to do it. That's extrinsic motivation. But Clarence takes a much more nuanced approach to this, and it's particularly helpful in leadership. And it's actually um, what I used to, or what we all used to teach um, the British Army at the Royal Military Academy Sandhurst, the same thing, you know, leadership is leadership and motivating people is central to leadership. And McClellan talks about uh, achievement, belonging, control. He actually calls them the need for power, the need for affiliation and the need for achievement. So he says that every person in a team has these three needs, right? And a good leader is able to satisfy or facilitate these needs. Now, I like to shorten them down just to the ABC of leadership. So achievement, belonging and control. So what is achievement, right? So everybody who works or who interacts with other people, they, they want to feel like they achieve things. Um, and if you never have the feeling that you achieve something, say you're a teacher, and everything you do, no matter how hard you work, no matter how well you get your kids to do this, that or the other, your sense of achievement is never full because uh, perhaps you're not recognized for what you do. And we are social creatures, so recognition is very important for us. Um, and if we're recognized by our leaders for the job that we do and the achievements that we make, then that motivates us and it makes us feel like 
we want to go back and do more of it. Um, however, poor leadership does not allow people to achieve. Uh, it takes achievement for itself and says, I achieved that. Good leadership allows the people who achieve it to have, have their moment and have their time and have their recognition. Uh, a word of warning. Um, I've also seen schools where they overdo achievement, where they everybody gets an award for everything and every teacher is praised for doing this, that, and the other. And at the end of the day, it means nothing because it's all just so much blah, blah, blah and hot air. So this is a very nuanced thing and it's something that requires a lot of empathy and understanding. Um, the second one is then belonging. Yes, we are social animals and so we have the, the need to belong. We want to be a part of something. And this is quite normal. The, our first sense of belonging is, is to our mother um, and then to our father and then to our siblings and our family and then to our village and then to our football team and then to our cricket team and then to the choir that we sing in and then to the county that we live in and then to the nation that we live in and then to the university that we go to. And so as we go through life, we consistently have these ideas of belonging, which are very important to us. And we are motivated by belonging. When we belong to something, it, something goes off in our head and we just feel good because we belong. However, the punishment and the reverse of that is when we're made to feel like we don't belong. Uh, we're not a part of something. Um, and so I'm, I'm going a bit over time here. Uh, do chip in and tell me if I'm going over time. Um, uh, so essentially a good leader um, creates situations where people can belong and where people feel like they're part of a team and not just something that is said to tick a box. Again, that's never underestimate people's intelligence. People can see it when you're doing a box ticking exercise because you can see it. I can see it. And when we're leaders, never forget that they can see it too, right? It has to be genuine. Um, and this is important that people feel a part of something. And so here school cultures, for example, are very important. Um, how do we generate a successful school culture? You know, and how do we make people belong to that? And then there's control. And control is uh, what McClellan calls the need for power. Um, we all need to have some control over the things that we do in our life. Uh, this is why when, when you're being told what to do all the time and bossed around and you can't do anything yourself, you become deeply demotivated because there's no, you have no control over what you can do. But it's hugely empowering to have control over aspects of what you do. And this is very much about that distributed form of leadership too, allowing people to have more control over what they do, giving them the power, trusting them and nurturing them. Right? So I think that's a, a really interesting uh, view. I mean, if you want a quick takeaway from today's session, it's a really interesting view on, um, on, on leadership motivation. And you can you know, look up McClelland and read more about him in your own free time. OK, next slide. I'm aware that we started a little bit late. So um, I think I've got about another five minutes. Ten, yeah, 10 minutes. Yeah. And then and then we'll. We'll proceed to questions. So here's another couple of here a couple of things to take away from this session. Um, obviously, I can't get into the the real intellectual depth of of the course in a short session like this, but I can give you some helpful takeaways um, to think about and maybe to to guide your thinking in over the next months or years. Now, there's a, a gentleman called uh, Cialdini, and some of you may be familiar with him. He ended up being a professor of psychology in the US, can't remember where, but he developed these things called um, the, uh, the influencers, right? And, and this, is, uh, this is an amazing way of looking at how, how human behavior influences people. And so he has a list of different influencers and you can see the top left is something called reciprocation. So this is a really old truth, we all know this, you know, um, you go in many cultures when you go to someone's house, the first thing they'll do is they'll, they will offer you something as a present. It could be a cup of tea, could be biscuits. In the Middle East, of course, it would be coffee and, and dates or chocolate. Um, they would drown you in kindness in the Middle East. Um, such good hosts they are. 
Um, but what reciprocation does is it is it gives the other person the sense to give something back again as well. So it's used quite often uh, by salespeople. You know, if you go to the local car showroom, what's the first thing they'll do? They'll sort you out with a cup of coffee uh, and maybe some chocolates. And, and the brain doesn't really differentiate between uh, a Ford Mustang and a coffee and a chocolate. It just sees, I got something, so I will give. And so reciprocation is a, is a very powerful influencer. It's a way of influencing people. Um, then there's things like authority. Right? So, you know, you see these adverts of, of for, for toothpaste uh, on the television, and there's always uh, some gentleman or some woman in a, in a white coat with glasses looking at you and telling you this is a good toothpaste because it's jolly good and gets rid of everything. And, and we believe them and we trust them. Um, and yet, really, we know it's an actor. The only qualification they have is they went to drama school. They know nothing about dentistry or medicine, yet we believe them. Why? Because of the white shirt and the context, right? So Cialdini did some interesting experiments here. For example, he, he um, in the days when they still had, um, you know, you paid for your parking with a parking meter, um, he had some guy in New York next to some parking meters dressed in jeans and a t-shirt. And whenever someone pulled up next to the parking meter, he'd walk up to them and say, um, oh, I, I'll take care of your car for you. I'll feed the parking meter. Just give me a dollar. And without fail, everybody looked at the guy and said, no way. And they did it themselves. And then the next day, he got someone dressed in um, a uniform with a peaked cap. And he would go up to people and say, I'm looking after the parking meters. Please give me a dollar. I'll look after it. And without fail, everybody gave him a dollar. It was the same person. However, on one day he was wearing jeans and a t-shirt, on the other he was wearing a uniform. Why? Authority. We humans naturally um, believe in authority. We naturally go with authority. Uh, we're almost helpless when we see authority, right? And so we have this too as teachers. We have a certain amount of authority and educational leaders have that too through their position. And we can make people aware of our authority as well by uh, talking in particular ways, by talking about particular things, um, by holding ourselves in a particular way, and all sorts of things like that. So anyway, there's a whole bunch of influences here. There's actually six that um, Cialdini uh, identified, uh, and they're all very interesting to read up on. I would, I would recommend you um, have a good look at that in your own time. Okay, next slide. Yeah, okay, yeah, that's just one to say that he actually added a seventh called Unity, which is, uh, again, nice. It's uh, It goes back again to McClelland, if you think about it, about that sense to to be part of something, that sense of belonging. So uh, unity or being united in something, being together, is a massive motivator amongst people when, when we can be together. And that, again, speaks to this collaborative approach towards leadership in schools is that's an enormous motivator if you can develop school cultures in that particular way. Next slide. Yeah, okay, so this is the behavioral stairway model. Um, this is actually a model that was developed by the New York Police Department and the FBI in the US. We use this uh, um, every single day in the Royal Military Academy Sandhurst to train young officers about influencing people. Um, and it's a very it's a very good tool to learn, um, say, uh, you know, the nuts and bolts of leadership at the very beginning. This doesn't help you with an intellectual development. It doesn't help you to uh, become a bigger person, a more powerful person in terms of your thinking. Only something like a master's degree or a PhD can do that, in my view, or, or lots and lots of self-study and reflection could do that too over a period of years. But what this can do is it shows you how influence works, right? So it's a stairway. So the first part of the here is active listening. So that means engaging with people, listening to them, um, responding to them, taking them seriously. From that, you go into empathy, which is when you start to generate empathy, people start to understand that you see where they're coming from and they see where you're coming from. From empathy, you then get into rapport, which means that you start to be able to, to talk in ways that 
are um, consensual, that you start liking each other, that um, you start getting kind of feeling going on with each other. And then from rapport, then you start getting into influence. That's when you can start influencing people. And so you can use, for example, some of those Cialdini things that I was talking about, or you, as an educational leader, you would be um, using this to, to then influence teachers and, and other, other educational leaders to, to do particular things that, that will help the organization. And if you think about good leadership, that's, that's what most good leadership will do. Poor leadership goes straight for the influence, right? So they don't go through the processes of building empathy in a relationship. They just go straight for influence. And that'd be quite transactional, right? And it's quite jarring. You can see that happen when people do that to you. You see yourself being influenced. And I'm quite analytical about this process. So you can imagine for me, every time I deal with my uh, superiors, um, I've, I've got a whole list of things going on in my head as to what they're doing. I have to really switch off sometimes and stop being so analytical about that because it doesn't matter how high you get in the world, there's always someone higher than you, isn't there? Uh, and um, and so this is a, but 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 I would say that looking back on that, um, I respect people enormously who take the time to go through that process because that is how um, we trust people. And trust is everything, and uh, that's one of the ways that you get there, and you get behavioural change, which means that you get leadership to happen uh, to serve the cause, the school, the mission, etc. Okay, next slide. Okay, that's not going to work, but that's a great video to watch. I recommend it. You might want to show it also to your students um, in class. Uh, it's very funny. Uh, it's called It's Not About the Nail. Note it down and, uh, and do watch it. You'll find it probably on, on any of the kind of online video providers that you might care to use. Okay, next slide. Okay, so this is, um, this is taken from the United Nations. These are global goals for sustainable development. If I had more time, I'd talk a little bit more about this and, and global citizenship education, which is something that's very close to my heart. And I think that's it. for any educator working in the international sphere and in the national sphere, global citizenship education is one of our futures, if not the future. In fact, I've got an article in review at the moment, which is exactly about this. It's educational leadership as global citizenship education, um, taking a step away from um, the nuts and bolts spreadsheets and Excel sheets and thinking about how do we as educational leaders take the responsibility of our post really seriously and take the next step and help to make the world a better place. Okay, next slide. Okay, so this, this is more details now about the actual course itself, the master's degree. Um, I'm aware of time, so I'll just, I'll just gloss now and then, and then I'll hand back to Dubai because they're gonna tell you a little bit more about details, but essentially, it's a two-year master's degree, which we consider to be part-time. We do also have a one-year full-time master's degree in Manchester, but then you'd have to come to Manchester. Um, this is a very, very good mix of best of both worlds scenario, because you get to have four major conferences over your two years, which will be hosted in Dubai through University of Manchester academics, such as myself. So you're not away tucked away at distance working alone you are connected with your academics at the university you get to know them you get to meet us you get to interact with us chat with us email us talk to us face to face have dinner with us etc etc all the things that you would normally do in a program and they're not academics who um who we've recruited locally in the uae these are our proper top academics at the University of Manchester um, and and they they come to you um, rather than um, you having no access to them at all so I think that's a real bonus of this course and also the people on your cohort are like you there's about 20 of them and they are like you they are um, intellectualized they are teachers and teacher leaders 
uh, they are ambitious and they are going places and that is your network and in 10 years time they will all be places as you will be and you will have this uh, like you do in traditional courses you'll have this broader outreach this network this community that's very very important to us in building this course that you actually have that but you have it all in Dubai you don't have to go uh, to England or to Shanghai or wherever to have that um, and we still maintain the high high quality of our original Manchester University undiluted completely based to you okay next slide All right, so this is just an overview of the different units so in semester one you look at models of educational leadership semester two you do engaging with educational leadership research next slide mm -hmm. yeah semester two semester three. Oh, semester three um towards the end of semester three you have one unit where you can either do apl which is accreditation for prior learning so if you have postgraduate credits from a different master's degree somewhere, uh, you can apply to have that unit free, or you can do one of our uh, two, three, sorry, optional units. Um, my favorite there would be international schools leadership. Um, as far as I'm aware, that is the only postgraduate master's degree course in international schools leadership. And I have written that specially for this uh, degree. I'm drawing strongly from my own research, but also from, from many others who've done good research in that area. Um, yeah, that's a great one. Okay, and next slide. Then in the final semester, rather than having one big, 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 um, you know, master's thesis, which often happens in these master's degrees, uh, we have half of that, we have a project, which is 30 credits. And the other 30 credits, we actually invest in three smaller research skills units which teach you proper research skills like you kind of have in a PhD obviously minimized and smaller but what that then does is it activates your research ideas your ways of approaching data which you will use as an educational leader in order to create, create and find data and find truth to support your work and then it leaves the final project as half of what most of these big projects are. Usually they're 60 credits. This one though is a 30 credit final project uh, at the end. And that's how you then finish off uh, the degree after two years. Next slide. Okay, so um, I'm not gonna go through that because A, you can read that, and B, um, I think the questions that you'll have will be, will be quite obvious. I've kind of covered this a little bit, which is obviously, um, you know, what kind of person does this degree? Well, uh, the people we have so far doing this degree are all, um, I, I find them all quite impressive people. I think that they're all, they're, they're very sparky. They're very, uh, they are intellectually capable. They are thinkers, but they're also doers. And, these are people I can see are going places. Their only choice was how, you know, what path do I take in order to go where I'm going to go? Because they're going there anyway. Um, you know, they came to us and, and that's where they are. And they will be, um, some of them already are, you know, heads of departments. Some of them are uh, principals of, of large schools, uh, very large schools even. So some people are already in position, but they've got there through very much hard work. And now they want to catch up with themselves and get the qualification that they know they need and they know they need it. Uh, then there are others who are on the other side of that equation who are still teachers, but say they've maybe got uh, a, a pedagogical coordinating role. They're ambitious, they want to move up, but they need this in order to take, start taking the steps. That, and, and part of what this degree does also is it's not just the piece of paper you get. Um, you know those conversations that you're in, those meetings where uh, often the dialogue, the conversation can go over your head or you're not equipped with the right words to respond or the conceptions or the conceptualizations. That's what this does. It gives you that critical competency that you can engage, that you can hear power as it's talking in the room and you can see 
what's going on in the room through your intellectual engagement and then you can use that to levy your own influence and that's what this whole, this whole process of this master's degree is about is about growing that intellectual capacity and giving you the power to be able to be in that position so yeah those are the those are the kind of things that it will give to you and um I mean, if i speak for myself i, I would say that this process um, can be one of the, the biggest life-changing events um, that happens to you because it literally changes and grows the way you think about you not just personally but professionally as well who am i where am i going what's my orientation how do i get there um, so i think i think all of these things feed into this master's degree next slide Yeah, so typically we'll ask for a 2-1, uh, which if you're familiar with the British system is um, the second highest uh, qualification you'd get at degree, uh, bachelor's degree level. Um, however, I'm the program director and, and I, am, uh, I have accepted people onto the course who do not have a 2-1, who have a 2-2, um, because of their professional experience. So if they've been in education for a while, if, if, they, if they show that they have the metal to do that then it's perfectly feasible that it's not the two one that is the highest requirement however if you are relatively junior in the organization if you're starting out uh, then uh, a two one is possibly uh, what we've been looking at also because um, the actual requirement of doing a master's degree at an institution like manchester is quite intellectually challenging i, I won't sugarcoat it it is an intellectual challenge um, uh, and it's a wonderful thing, if you ask me, an intellectual challenge like that. But there has to be some basis there from which we can grow. Um, yeah, like it says there, an initial qualification teaching uh, is good, or at least two years professional experience. Um, we do ask for an IELTS test score of 6.5 or equivalent, if English is not your first language. Again, this is important just because of language, because the texts that we'll ask you to engage with are um, challenging for native speakers as well. They are challenging. And so we do require that. And the intake is this September. Now, uh, all the details of that um, are probably best explained, not by me, but by the Manchester Centre. So I think I've kind of um, done most of my bit now. Shall I hand over to Dubai from Austria? Thank you, Alex. Thank you for that very informative session. Um, yes, um, just to, to uh, go over with the information, uh, as, as Alex said, uh, this is what we're looking for when it comes to the uh, criteria. And at the same time, this is the current fee uh, we're offering. It's about 16,800 sterling pounds, which is payable in four installments. Uh, I understand we are giving out an early bird discount, but please contact us so we can help you out more in uh, providing you uh, an assistance uh, uh, due to the situation ongoing right now uh, with the pandemic. We are very much aware of that and we're here to, to help you out. We're here to assist you with this. After this uh, session, um, your advisors or the University of Manchester Middle East Center will definitely contact you uh, provide your information about it and we will be, be more than happy to advise you all the possible things that we can help you regarding the program uh we don't have much time really but i want to accommodate some of the questions alex uh, just to make sure that we can uh, we can go over with that uh, especially with uh, some of the questions regarding uh, the program itself uh are you okay with it alex for a while just like another four questions perhaps sure all right, so here we are receiving a lot of them, actually. And I will just try to summarize as much as I can. But let me hear, let me give you this question first, Alex. How do students interact with the teaching staff? Yeah, so um, with, say we've got six units, right? So uh, there will be a different academic who is the lead teacher on each unit. Uh, sometimes you'll do two, like because I'm program director, I, I actually do two units. But so so you'll be interacting on a weekly or daily basis through Blackboard, which is our online medium, with your um, course lecturer. 
The course lecturer will also offer tutorials um, regularly throughout the course. So that's when you get to log in like this on a webinar thing. Uh, but it's much more two-way. So this is actually me just talking at you. Uh, in our webinars, we, we actually have a very much to and fro. That's how you interact with your lecturer. And then uh, four times a year, one of those lecturers, if not two or, or a mixture of them, will be in Dubai and then will interact with you for three days nonstop um, in terms of working with you, tutoring you, mentoring you. Um, and so it's this blended mixture of having the face-to-face -face contact, the physical contact with your lecturers in Dubai, and then the distance contact through Blackboard, PebblePad, and our online webinars. All right, and uh, I, I highly encourage uh, all the attendees to, to just uh, uh, ask me questions in the chat box. Please use the chat box. We'll try to answer as, we'll try to answer as much as we can, although I'm, I'm flooding with questions now. But another question here, Alex. Um, in, since the, the program is happening in Dubai, what will be the degree then? Is it the Dubai degree or is it the Manchester degree? You graduate with a degree from the University of Manchester, Great Britain. Okay, that's very clear. So the degree there's says no, your name, with of no. course the master's uh, in education, leadership in practice, uh, completion of the program, and that's it, right, Alex? That's what you're saying, no, right? There's no difference between the qualification value of this degree and our on-campus master's in education, leadership degree. There's no difference at all. I would say the only difference is, is that this one here is more user friendly. And I think um, for any professional, more accessible because it's over two years. Professionals can't take a year out of work and go to Manchester. I know that. I've been one myself in that same boat. Mm -hmm. This degree is perfectly suited for you as a professional to be able to do the degree whilst you're still doing your job as well. And it's no different from our standalone degree in Manchester. Understandable. Um, question here regarding the online classes. Uh, is there any timing with it? Is there like a certain timing that they need to attend? Yeah. Uh, so we try and um, we try and do them after school. So for which would be school for you, not for us. So we go by your time. So typically we have them about four o'clock in the afternoon. Um, at the moment we have them on a Thursday. Um, and we have them like every three weeks or so. We have a, an online tutorial. The tutorials are, are, are not the, the bread and butter of the course. They're, they're meaningful, significant points throughout the course where we connect face to face to explain things and talk things through that might be more complex or like the assessment or and guide you on that, for example. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, another question here. I'm originally from Manchester. Would the course fees be the same if I returned to Manchester and enrolled for the two-year program? So um, that's a good question. Um, the, the course fees are different for UK students if you're in the UK and if you're in Manchester, for obvious reasons, you know that. Um, if, if you're applying as, a, as an international student to go and do a BA in, in Manchester, you will pay international fees. If you live in Britain and pay taxes in Britain and apply in Britain, you will pay home fees, right? Um, so what we've done with the Dubai thing is it's a middle thing. You're not paying the, the what can often be quite high international fees. Um, you're paying, I think the 16,000 pounds is uh, a middle thing between a full expat fee and the home fee. Uh, you can, of course, go uh, back to Manchester, live in Manchester, work in Manchester, and do the Manchester version of this course as well, and that would then be cheaper. Um, but you wouldn't have the flexibility of having the centers. The great thing about the centers is we have five of them, and we have them in Shanghai, Hong Kong, Singapore, Dubai, Sao Paulo. So you can use any one of those centers if you're on the international course, which we've found in the past is quite an appeal for international teachers, because they tend to you know, move around the world, and this is quite appealing for them. So I, I hope that answers your question. Okay. 
uh, again, for further questions later on, we'll be more than happy to contact you and provide you, I would say, more explanation to that apart from what Alex said. Uh, another question here, Alex. Um, I'm halfway of my um, of my of my program in another university. Can I transfer my credits? Um, it depends what university, I suppose, because um, you know, I mean, to be to be honest with you, most universities, uh, as I said at the beginning, are rigorous and good and solid, right? So that shouldn't be a problem. Uh, but there are some universities where it, it could be a problem. If you can tell me which one it is, it would be easier for me to tell you how easy that would be. If you're halfway through a program, then you'd have to define what halfway means, uh, because typically we look at a master's degree as having 180 credit points. That's pretty universal around the world. So if you're halfway, it sounds to me then like you've, you've done 90 points already. Um, I think that's something we could probably talk about. We haven't done it before. We haven't done it yet. Having said that, we haven't been up and running for 20 years. We've only been up and running for a year. So we don't have that much uh, longitudinal knowledge of, of how we approach a situation like that. But it might be a question worth sending directly to us and then we can look at it in more detail. I think, it, I think we can work on that later on. Thank you for that question. Uh, a couple of more uh, here, Alex. Is it possible to provide some outline of a typical module ending assignment? Uh, she, she would like to know and understand more on the scope. If you can yeah, give sure. a few. Yeah, sure. So uh, our, our five set models and with the optional one six, they are, are relatively homogenous in what they look like. Uh, there, there are two final assignments that come at the end of them. Uh, the, the larger part, which is usually 70%, is something that refers to the unit itself. So let's take um, models of educational leadership, right? The first unit. So the first assignment is then a, a critical review of some of the literature, looking at about a minimum of 10 different journal articles in that area and reviewing them. And then the second part of the assignment is a critical reflection of my or of your professional practice and how that resonates with the, the learning points covered within that unit. And so then in the second one, when it's a second unit, when it's about educational research, the main job there is a literature review that you have to write uh, detailing the particular um, you know, bits of literature that you've read in the course, but also other ones that you've found. And then the second part again is a practical review uh, and, and critical reflection of learning points you've discovered. Because throughout the course, we, we, we continually build in this uh, reflective practice by uh, doing reflective reviews of your practice and engaging with the material. That's why the degree is called Educational Leadership in Practice. It's not something that you do and then come away with untouched from. This degree touches you. It goes to the heart of your practice and it makes you engage with that practice. And that's what the assignments look like at the end of every component. They're 4,000 word assignments in total. Uh, and you have about three weeks at the end of the course to prepare for that. Um, yeah, that's what it looks like. All right, thank you for that. Um, I would, Doc, Dr. Alex McTaggart we would love to answer all those questions, but we don't have much time anymore. But last one, doctor, um, uh, this is a very interesting question. Why would you recommend to study now in the situation that we're, we're currently facing? Um, well, you know, um, this is probably one of the, I mean, you've got to be very, very careful what, what we say about now is that we're, we're living through a, tra a tragic time at the moment, you know, for, for many families, this has been a time characterized by loss and by tragedy and so i have to say that and respect that on the other side of that um, if you're thinking about your professional growth if you're thinking about um, how do i how do i manifest as a professional when all this is done when the dust is settled um, one of the things that you you will possibly want as we move forward uh, is to have increased your pro professional credentials, to have grown as an individual. And I think that one of the, the most important things in times of adversity 
and of difficulty is when we emerge from the other side having grown from the experience uh, not having barely survived the experience and so i think a, a degree like this offers the perfect scope for that kind of growth and that kind of development and it does so in a way that engages with you with pertinent issues of our humanity and about looking out for each other and looking out for our communities and our schools and our groups i couldn't possibly couldn't think of a better time for this to be relevant and apt than right now oh thank you for that thank you for that doctor it's been a pleasure uh, alex thank you so much for your time and once You're again welcome. Uh, for those who have not, for those who were not able to answer, we will try to send it to Alex for for his, his feedback probably, and, and try to send it to you all. Um, we we will be more than happy to assist you. We'll be sending you all the emails uh, hopefully by tomorrow, and uh, we will be more than happy to talk to you over the phone if you need more counseling about the program. We're here to help you out. And uh, the next step. Uh, if, if you are able, if you're interested to pursue or to know your eligibility without paying anything, you can start your application and we will proceed to the next step afterwards. Once again, uh, Dr. Alex Gardner McTaggart, thank you for your time. Any parting words, sir, before we end uh, the session? Uh, look, all of you, uh, thank you so much for, for coming to our webinar today. Uh, our colleagues in Dubai are highly professional and very experienced at, at dealing with your requests and we'll do a really good job of it and before i say goodbye to you all i just want to from my part of the world to your part of the world um thinking about the, the topics we've covered today thinking about you know how can we make this planet of ours a better planet and how do we do that with education and where do we start through teaching and through leading teaching i, I want to wish you safety and health and happiness and um, I'd love to see you on this course if you can make it. And if not, I wish you all the very best in, in your continuing career. Goodbye. All right. The pleasure is all ours, uh, Dr. Alex McTaggart. Thank you once again. Um, for everybody, please be safe. And again, together we can do better. Have a safe, uh, have a beautiful day, everybody. And we will talk to you soon. Bye for now. Bye-bye. Yeah.